Hello to everyone, my name is Steve Tamaro and today I will introduce you a special issue published in a journal of transport geography entitled Segregation and Mobility, understanding the nexus between inequality, segregation and sustainable urban mobility. The special issue has been edited together with Professor Andres Sepchuk from Massachusetts Institute of Technology and Professor Frank Whitlocks from Ghent University. First I will introduce you the context of the special issue then I will introduce the equitable sustainable mobility model and finally I will also bring to you some of the highlights of the special issue. Within the context of the climate crisis, one of the biggest challenges that cities face is how to increase sustainable mobility. And obviously one of the focus is to reduce the use of personal cars. And in designing different planning interventions more broadly, cities worldwide are inspired by the 15-minute city concept. The author of the 15-minute city concept is Professor Carlos Moreno. And according to him, cities should be planned in a way that all important daily activity places can be reached within 15 minutes by active travel modes, that is, by biking and by walking. And cities discovered this approach, especially during the COVID-19 and during the lockdowns, when mobility was reduced and all of a sudden the air in the cities became clean. And we can probably even claim that this is the most widely applied social sciences concept ever. Also, in my hometown in Tallinn, the capital city of Estonia, the city planners are inspired by the 15-minute city concept. However, there has been also critique towards this approach, and maybe one of the most wordy has been the professor of economics at Harvard University, Edward Glaser. And according to him, 15-minute city is a dead end, and he compares planning cities based on the 15-minute city concept as reintroducing ghettos to our cities. Interestingly, this is not a new debate, and when we look back to history, in 1929 Clarence Perry introduced the neighborhood concept where he argued that the cities should be placed uh, as small communities that are centered around the schools and people, especially kids, have the opportunity to walk safely from home to school. However, in 1948, uh, Perry was criticized by Reginald Isaacs, and uh, Isaacs argued that neighborhood based planning could lead to inequalities and segregation in our cities. And inequalities and segregation are as important concerns in today's cities as they were a century ago. In 2021, we've published with colleagues a book, Urban Socioeconomic Segregation and Income Inequality, where we studied cases all around the world. And the main message of this book is that residential segregation in world cities arises or hoovers at high levels. This stylized graph summarizes the main findings of the book. We have two time points here and circles with three sizes. The biggest circles represent urban regions, the middle-sized circles represent core cities, and the smallest circles represent suburban communities. And the triangulars show where the affluent and less affluent or poorer households are living. So what we see in our cities is that on the one hand, affluent households are clustering more and more into the inner cities as well as to the waterfront areas. That is the process that we call gentrification. On the other hand, the lower income households are pushed away from these more attractive areas and they seek housing in areas where housing is more affordable and that is mainly in the suburbs. So cities are getting more and more segregated. And what happens now if we reduce mobility in the cities and bring all the everyday opportunities and activities going to schools, to work, going to uh, attend different leisure time activity sites it happens that also segregation of the residential neighborhoods gets transmitted to these other activity sites, to workplaces, to schools, and to leisure time activity places. 
In short, the 15 minutes city concept prioritizes cities to become environmentally more sustainable by reducing mobility. However, cities face triple dilemma. First, they have to be economically dynamic. They are the places that provide opportunities for people. They should be also socially inclusive as big inequalities also lead to major problems. And also they should be envir environmentally sustainable. Whenever we shift the policies towards one corner of this triangle, we get problems in the other two corners of the triangle. For example, if we reduce mobility in the cities, we get more segregated cities, workplaces, schools, leisure time activity sites, but we also cut away people from job opportunities that are more distant. And that reduces the flexibility on the labor markets and the economic dynamics of the cities. Hence, any policies in the cities should take a balance between these three dilemmas and try to avoid shifting the focus only to one corner of this triangle. And this is the context from where our special issue has been born. And we tried to find out how we can increase sustainable travel modes without making it at the cost of economic dynamics or social inclusiveness of the cities. And in our special issue, we have 16 different case studies from different parts of the world that either directly deal with the 15-minute city or with other aspects that relate to the shift to a more sustainable travel modes in a city in a way that is also more equitable and just. Based on these interventions, we propose an equity-centered model of sustainable mobility in the editorial of our special issue. And with this model, we would like to highlight the more complex solutions we need in order to solve the triple dilemma without uh, making compromises with any corners of the triangular we saw before. So the model includes four layers that are further aggregated into spatial structures and mobility dynamics. The first layer is about the opportunity distribution in the cities. We know already from the works of Walter Christoller from the 19th century that different opportunities and services have different catchment areas, which means that they cannot be evenly distributed over the urban space. Some opportunities need and services need bigger catchment areas, some need smaller catchment areas, and can be easier brought closer to home. A good example here is the educational system that was also in the focus of the Clarence Harris way of thinking. The lower is the level of uh, educational institution, like kindergartens, elementary schools, the easier it is to locate them closer to home. And on the other hand, the higher is the educational uh, uh, facility, the more complicated it is to bring it closer to home. For example, at the gymnasium level, the distribution, special distribution of schools is very different compared to kindergartens. Likewise, the distribution of jobs and leisure time activities cannot be evenly distributed. Furthermore, some cities also locate some of these, so to say, landmark activities to areas they want people to move to in order to increase the social mixing and interactions in the cities. For example, by locating public library of the city to maybe less disadvantaged neighborhood. So the first layer that we have to carefully think about is the distribution of distribution of opportunities in the cities, because this is why people cluster into the cities. They have to have access to opportunities. And so the next layer of represents mobility infrastructure, and that is about access from home to different types of mobilities. And the two next layers represent the mobility dynamics. 
And what is maybe important to stress here is that people do not live alone, but they are clustered into homes as families. And each family member has somewhat different needs when it comes to urban mobility. They have different destinations, different places that they need to visit. Furthermore, if we think about uh, the, the family with, who, with two breadwinners, then both adults have to get to their jobs and the jobs tend to be spread more in urban space and it is important that people have access both to close to home job opportunities and also to those opportunities that are more distant from homes. Otherwise cities become less dynamic as people don't get access to all opportunities, labor markets become less flexible and maybe people can't find jobs that best match to their skills. But likewise we have to consider the activity spaces of children, they are at different ages, and also the activity spaces of different uh, uh, children at different ages is very, very different. Finally, there is also a lot of research on the mobility of, of the elderly people, and again, their activity spaces and needs can be very different compared to, let's say, nuclear family with two adults and, and, and children. So if we don't know well the activity spaces and needs of people, it's very difficult also to provide the solutions that work best. And only the last layer is about the travel modes. And if we think that people have to get to opportunities both close to home and to more distant locations, it immediately means that only active travel modes is not enough to solve all the dilemmas and challenges that cities face. Also, what we highlight in our editorial is that these different layers are related to each other. Let's take the example of mobility infrastructure and activity spaces. On the one hand, uh, people who live already in certain neighborhoods have access to certain mobility infrastructures. They can uh, either use public transit uh, or if uh, bikeways are close to home, bike or walk, or they are more car dependent. So where you live determines what kind of mobility infrastructure is accessible to you. On the other hand, families can also move to live to these neighborhoods where those mobility infrastructure elements are available that they value the most. For example, if you value sustainable travel modes, you can move to neighborhoods where sustainable travel modes are more accessible. In short, these different layers also interact closely with each other, and it's very well shown in many contributions included in our special issue. However, the contributions also show that the way to equity-centered model of sustainable mobility is bumpy. Many cities are still strongly car-oriented, or can be characterized as elitist when it comes to a switch towards sustainable mobility. And with this we mean that sustainable travel modes are more accessible for certain households that tend to be more wealthy or to certain neighborhoods that tend to be located in the inner parts of the city. It means that there is a lot of work still to do to achieve an equitable sustainable mobility. And we have to deal with mode inequity, access to different travel modes, varies by different population groups and neighborhoods. We have to deal with group equity to really secure that the switch towards sustainable mobility is socially inclusive and all social groups and population groups benefit from it. We have to deal with residential inequities as cities are highly segregated and the segregation levels is either growing or staying at these high levels. But also we have to deal with time inequality as the different travel modes, even if available, uh, for example, sustainable travel modes, they still need uh, more time when people move around in the city. It's very difficult to compete with the speed of cars. And that is something that we have to deal more and more in switching towards the sustainable travel modes. To conclude, 
we have five key takeaway messages that come from the different contributions of the special issue. First, urban opportunities cannot be distributed equally over, over urban space, as is envisioned by the 15-minute city concept. We have to understand that there are lots of activities, lots of opportunities that can be brought close to home, but also many activities and many opportunities stay away from close to home. Also, what we find from one contribution to another is that still the biggest differences exist between the inner cities and suburbs. Inner cities are first best, best equipped with opportunities, but they are also best equipped with the opportunity to use sustainable travel modes to access these opportunities. In other words, we have to deal more with the suburbs and people living in the suburbs if we would like to achieve a more equitable shift towards sustainable mobility. We have also to understand that both short distance and long distance mobility is part of how the cities function. As it is not possible to distribute even the all the opportunities, jobs, schools, leisure time activity sites, then we have to secure that people also get to more far away places and get access to more far away opportunities. If we would like to secure the economic dynamics and social inclusiveness of the cities. As cities are highly segregated residentially, both along ethnic and racial lines, as well as along income and socio-economic lines, then it's impossible to achieve equitable transition to sustainable mobility if we do not deal with these high levels of uh, residential segregation, with the rise of house prices and the whole process of what we call the commodification of housing, where homes her houses are not only homes, but also increasingly investment objects for short-term rental and for many other purposes. Finally, sustainable access to urban opportunities is the key, rather than the distance or time we need to travel. So access is and remains the key word. And for securing access to these opportunities in sustainable ways, we have to think how to improve all different travel modes that work towards this goal. It's about public transit, it's about e-bikes, it's about car sharing and many other opportunities maybe that we even don't know yet, in addition to walking and biking. And when it comes to uh, the most common ways how people travel, it's the combination of, of walking and public transit and we have to do a lot more to make this uh, more efficient in many cities around the world. With this, thank you so much and enjoy the reading of the special issue. My name is Pete Tamaro and we edited this special issue together with Professor Anders Zetschuk and Professor Frank Wittlers. Bye bye.